Okay, good morning. I see everyone so tired, so dejected, that I don't even feel like trying April's full jokes. I had in mind to tell you that I won the Mega Billion last night, that I was abandoning the class, giving you all A's, going to task and to buy a villa, but yeah, okay. Five weeks, five weeks, put an effort. I know the transition from COVID distance teaching to real academic life was difficult and COVID is still around us, but you have to put an effort. Now, today I'm not going to continue with my demonstration of DocuWiki. I will complete briefly the demonstration of advanced features next week as I explained on Wednesday, because my intention is to go through the rest of the notes that I had posted on Monday from chapters uh, four and five, four, chapter four we've done already, the rest of chapter five from the textbook on the social history of the media. However, at the beginning of this class, I posted uh, the instructions for the assignment that is due tonight, I would like to know if there is anything more particular uh, in reference to the things you're trying to do with your DocuWiki page for this assignment that you would like me to show on the screen or explain. So I, I think most students, even from the messages that arrived to me, have uh, at least started the work if you found difficulty with one aspect of the coding language, I can open one of the demo pages and show you how to do one thing or the other, okay? So let me know now if you need any specific kind of assistance for the kind of formatting, structuring, or if you have any questions about the assignment in general. Of course, I'll be able to assist you through the afternoon as well. I'll be on my computer, so you can reach out to me via email if you have some issues or if you want to get on Zoom with me quickly because if you're having some technical issue or you need technical support, help with your page, the best thing is for us to put your page on the screen in Zoom to share the screen, and I can tell you, change that, or that is the source of your problem, or add that code, etc. okay? However, as I said earlier this week, I will be on my computer as usual until about 6 p.m. So don't wait until the last moment. If you do, uh, I, I will not respond to an email that is sent to me at 9 p.m. or at 1 a.m during the night and sometimes I, I look at my email on Saturday mornings but not always usually I resume work in the afternoon or evening or, or Sunday so keep in mind that waiting too long waiting until the last moment might not be the best approach in case you have some technical issue or in case you discover that you were you had something in mind to do with your page but you don't know out. Okay? Okay then. We have been talking about networks that were established even in areas that seem to be removed from the idea of media such as transportation. However, we've lost in our times, the perception that even the railroad system in the past was seen as a social network and a network of communication. And something that during the 19th century had a profound impact 
on societies, on, on different societies, especially Western societies and the US, where the railroad system was developed more quickly, had a profound effect on society and the way social interactions occurred, not just the economy. It was not just about the transportation of goods, products, supplies, raw material. It was the very existence of this network that changed the identity of the nation. Just think, in reference to the US, the deep consequences that the iron grid, that the crisscrossing of the continent from east coast to west coast with railroad tracks, the consequences this had on the surviving cultures of the Native Americans and how disruptive that was. It was not just about the wars and the, the fights, the struggles between the colonizers and the Native Americans, but this very fact that this uh, uh, grid of communication networks produced a kind of cage around these local communities and threatened in a, in a fatal way their existence, their survival, the survival of their culture in any pristine way. One of the last thing we did when we talked about this was to look at this painting by a British painter which shows you the train station in London and again this gives you a good idea, a good visual representation of what I'm talking about because you see the whole of society with different classes that are, are, are and in the background you see the train and that is the powerful representation of how relevant the train becomes for the whole of society. And you see how people are preparing for the trip. Actually, I think they've just arrived and they're uh, getting off the train. And, and you see the agitation, you see the energy about this. Although you don't find, I also want to use this to contrast with another uh, painting, you don't find the level of excitement that you'll find in a painting I'll show you later about the post office, right? But this is the beginning of this change. The existence of a network that changes the human experience. And therefore, this network, the railroad system, can be seen as a medium also, a social some of the issues surrounding the creation of a railroad system in these countries are very similar to the issues faced during the digital revolutions in societies during the 1990s, the early 2000s, sometimes into uh, our decade. The fact that you need infrastructural investments in order for the network to uh, operate, and therefore you have this uh, ambiguous, sometimes not transparent, not clear, or conflictual interaction between private investments and public resources that need to be deployed. And then, of course, to complicate th things further, you have states putting in some of the money, and then the need also to regulate, and regulation, introduction of policies creates conflict with the interests of the commercial companies that are relying on this infrastructure, okay? But in terms of knowledge, and that's why this is kind of a medium because of the downfall, the impact on knowledge, in terms of knowledge, it's not just the technology. You have the technology, but then you need to establish universal technical standards, right? You need, for example, to say, how wide should the tracks be? Because if the tracks in Italy have a different width compared to the tracks, the railroad tracks in France or Austria, then trains cannot travel seamlessly from Rome to Paris, from Rome to Vienna, and vice versa. So if you really need to have a network, then it has to be global network so supported by global knowledge, right? You need globalized 
standards. And, and there you see that these kinds of networks are just the early manifestations of a globalization, of a globalized series of globalization processes that reaches uh, the social media or, or the metaverse or whatever incarnation you want to identify as the cutting edge of digital networks these days. You need standards also in reference to knowledge for the professional training of the crews that are on board the train. Keep in mind that trains in the beginning require a, an extensive crew, right? And, and again, we've lost the sense of all of this and how trains operated in the past because right now you have a conductor, you have a couple of people essentially on board a train, whereas in the past you had several engineers running the locomotive, you had people on board, staff on board, checking the tickets and providing services. But for example, you also had uh, uh, brake operators because there wasn't a single system in the, in the early trains, but this is true uh, oftentimes up to the 1900s or 1910s. You don't have a system of brakes. You cannot brake the whole train, stop the whole train uh, from the, the, the first, from the locomotive. You have people on board, uh, with uh, levers, levers that they operate so that they can break the train whenever necessary, etc. So you, you have uh, a, a lot of people working around the infrastructure to keep the trains operating. And then in terms of knowledge, you also have to emphasize, appreciate the fact that there are some aspects in the passenger's experience that need to be also standardized and globalized. Because you have a seamless transition, you can actually go from Paris to Istanbul, from London to Naples, etc. But passengers also expect their uh, experience to be homogenized to a degree, and, and it does happen. Of course, you have to keep in mind that this network acquires immediately a strategic value, right? That it becomes vital for the economy in those countries to have a network of railroad tracks to transport goods, but then also to transport troops. And the entire approach toward changes in reference to the existence or introduction of those train lines, right? And again, we've lost some of the popular perception of this, but I can mention how there is this kind of funny book now, uh, written in Italy at the end in the 1880s, where, where and, and the purpose of the book is a pamphlet against the construction of tunnels, because of course, in order to cross from Italy to France or Switzerland or Austria, you have to go through the Alps. And the uh, Alpine passes are too, generally too high, uh, to have a train go through the passes. And so uh, the, the, the best way to cross into the other countries is to dig a tunnel under the Alps, which was done in several locations. And this pamphlet alerts the public, the Italian population of the dangers. And it's saying, don't, don't have those tunnels built because the invaders will come. This is just a trap, it's a ploy. This is being done so that people from Northern Europe will be able to invade us and we shouldn't have those tunnels to be more secure. And again, it, it, it feels odd to us, but it's a very strong uh, perception of the impact that these networks had. Of course, the steam engine was not just applied to trains, it was also applied to uh, naval transportation with the creation of steamships the first one with paddles, and then later on with propellers, right? And one of the most direct consequences of the creation of uh, steamships operating across local areas, the Mediterranean, the, the North Sea, etc., and also uh, at an oceanic level, right from the 1830s and 40s, you have steamships crossing the ocean, one of the consequences of the creation of this network is an increase in mobility and migration that takes place in the 1800s, especially migration from Europe 
to North America, especially the US, or from Europe to South America, and we're talking about millions of people, is a direct consequence of this. But it's not just, again, it's not just the technology, it's not just the ship. It's, again, a network that is based not just on the technology, but also on knowledge. So migration itself becomes an industry, which is something that in many ways continues until now, right? We, we, we hear in the media about other factors, wars, uh, climate changes uh, that prompt migrations, but there are, there are organizations, legal and illegal criminal organizations profiting from uh, migration even now. During the time, you have marketing heavily applied to migration. That is to say, there are people who advertise the possibilities, the opportunities that one can find in the United States or in Argentina or in Brazil. So they go to the countryside of France, Italy, with postcards, with posters, or just by telling stories with pamphlets, encouraging people to purchase tickets and go and try to become more successful in the Americas. And in fact, the misconception is that the Europeans that during the 1800s moved from Europe into the Americas are people who have suffered the consequences of famine, let's say, the Great Famine in uh, Ireland in the 1840s, uh, or uh, the consequences of earthquake, uh, natural disasters, or um, the, the, the impoverished conditions uh, of people in Europe. In fact, later studies, the last 20 or 30 years, have established with documentary evidence that, yes, there are some of the poorest Europeans, especially from Southern Europe, who move into the Americas, but oftentimes is the middle class, is the lower middle class, is people who have this ambition, who are eager to succeed, who are eager to become wealthy, who tra traverse, uh, go across the ocean to work in the Americas. And you know how uh, the, the, for, for many decades, the initial format of migration in this case is transitory. That is to say you have people uh, that uh, um, spend 5, 10, 15 years in another continent and then go back to their countries with money to initiate an activity. So their goal is really to become entrepreneurs. And oftentimes it's just the main members of the communities who leave a family behind or who will form a family later in life. Okay? And we have this... this reflected also in literature and films. So, migration is being marketed, the opportunities are being marketed. You have agents in these countries, European countries such as France and Italy, with a license, but there will be many operating without a license, who take care of the paperwork for the people who want to enter the United States. And some of that, if you've been to Ellis Island, you, you find a lot of evidence visual and documentary evidence uh, of, of this phenomenon. If you've never been to Ellis Island, please go because it's one, uh, it's a beautiful experience, brings you back to that uh, period and you can see the register. Actually, there are digital records. You can access the digital records of the people who entered the United States and um, who they were, where they were from, uh, the kind of questions they had to answer once they got to Ellis Island or any other port of entry. It is once again a network because it's not like people go to the nearest port, walk in. Usually, and, and not every port will have a, a, a steamship that will take you across the ocean. Usually the process is you get on board a train from your village, you reach a train station, you get on board a train, and everything is planned by these agents, right? So they give you train tickets, tickets for the boat, you know what kind of food you will have on the boat, and the boat will be organized by classes, right? You have the third class at the bottom of the hull of the boat, you have second class, you have first class, third class will not be allowed on the bridge for more than a few hours a day, etc. So, Everything is 
organized and highly structured and it's a network you take advantage of the train network sometimes people from Italy for example will go by train to the uh, uh, western shores of France will go from Rome or Naples all the way to Le Havre uh, to then get on board a ship to go to let's say New York or to go to Buenos Aires the ocean steamers that were introduced in from from the 1840s on especially of course were also converted to military <coughs> use and this was especially common during World War I so even civilian ships were used to transport soldiers and supplies. But don't forget that steamships played a vital role in the development of a networked economy, also in areas where rivers uh, were, uh, mean, in, increased the possibility of transportation and communication, so along the Mississippi or the Hudson River, uh, etc. And when we talk about steam engines from the very beginning that were applied also to uh, submarines and, and again I don't know if you ever been to no Suffolk on Long Island uh, which is near Matitok uh, at Northward but no Suffolk on Long Island was the basis for the first uh, uh, group of uh, American submarine in the military submarines were experimented with in the Civil War became later on, only later after the Civil War, they became uh, a, a, a fixed um, unit uh, for, for the American Navy and their first base was on Long Island. You don't find much if you go there, if you, you find a, pl a, a, a plate, a metal plate explaining what it was, but of course you, you don't see much uh, that is left of that base. Steamships were used to transport also oil. Remember how we talked about oil, gas, other resources and the role they played in the development of those uh, society. So there is an increase in, in the use of oil exactly because oil can be transported on board those ships. Now, keep in mind that even ships that had steam engines oftentimes during the 19th century relied on sails as well. So actually they had a hybrid uh, mode of uh, propulsion using both sails and ships. And even during the time when steamships were very popular, you still find sailboats, that technology was not abandoned as a primary uh, form of transportation until midway through the 20th century. The invention of electricity and the introduction of electric lights on the ships increased the speed of the boats. Now, it was easier to uh, uh, continue traveling even through the night. Of course, if you were in the ocean, you could do it uh, in most instances uh, even before. But if you are navigating uh, close to the shores, then electric lights were essential. Having this globalized network of transportation caused the uh, precipitation of the need for a standardization of time, which happened in 1884 when it's established uh, what is the uh, time zone uh, for, for, for the first time zone for the standard time, which is Greenwich in uh, England. And clearly, from all of this, you can surmise that the next requirement for this network is some kind of wireless communication, which will come in the first decade of the 1900s. Although the telegraph anticipated that, anticipated radio in some ways. Even the postal network is a network that works like a media. That is to say, something that transports knowledge of different kinds. And the standardization and the process of making the post system more efficient starts with the introduction of stamps in the 1840s. Okay? Even before, of course, uh, the, uh, post, the, the, the mail had to be paid, right? Uh, 
But the idea of having flat rate postage make everything much more efficient. And this is the next painting that I want to show you and that I want you to contrast with the train station representation that we saw before, the general post office one minute to six, meaning when it's about to close. And you have here, in fact, if you want to, you can read, it's a beautiful page where everything is explained and also you find a comparison with the representation of train station and the painting we saw before. But in this case, there is more anxiety, more excitement about the post office in this painting, right? And again, it's the whole of society with different social classes represented intentionally and different kinds of activities to show how this network of communication has become vital to society. And what these various networks, including the postal network, introduce in, in, in society, in the culture, in the view, in the models of the human social experience, is the idea that speed is essential. And actually, the speed of mail was similar already to what it is now. In some instances, in some, for some countries, uh, the mail uh, uh, travel faster than it does now. For one thing, mail in the past was delivered in several locales several times a day instead of once a day. And for local mail, a 24 hour workaround uh, turnaround was common in many areas, especially large metropolitan areas such as Paris, London, etc. So you could uh, send a letter, a note to someone and have it delivered the next day. And if you wanted anything even faster or anything as fast across a longer distance, you would rely on the telegraph and telegram. And once again, we've lost the sense of the relevance of telegrams. And uh, I don't know if you ever uh, sent a telegram or uh, seen someone in your family send uh, one, but when I was a kid in the 1960s, telegrams were used even by families for a variety of reasons. And you see that, of course, if you watch Downton Abbey or uh, similar historical TV series and films. So it seems natural for us, but it wasn't like that, that everything has to be happening quickly. That was not the assumption for someone who lived and worked during the Middle Ages, during the Renaissance, during the early modern period, but it becomes increasingly the most valued dimension of life, and then during the 20th century, it becomes the thing, right? Modernity is associated with speed, thanks to the automobile first, and then to planes, to rockets, etc. Trains are connected to the distribution of mail, right? Of course, you put mail on board the trains, and keep in mind, you might have seen in some movies, especially from the 1920s and 30s, uh, that uh, even small stations would have this system whereby there would be a, a, a pole uh, with a hook, a bag with uh, mail would be attached to it, and the train had a device a mechanism that would allow them to collect that bag without stopping, just by slowing down when going through a station where the train would not normally stop, they would collect with an arm, a retractable arm, collect that bag of mail and bring it to destination. Look at the numbers, and at this point, many see the postal system as a relic, as a dinosaur, a relic from the past, something that should be eliminated, and the postal system itself, the carriers are turning into uh, competitors for FedEx and UPS delivering packages and not just uh, mail, but look at the numbers, 1863 in London, 161 million letters delivered, and 
12 times a day, right? So you know that you have a communication network and something that has a widespread impact on private society, on the economy, etc. And there are small things that are part of this evolution. The idea that you can purchase an envelope and you don't need glue because the glue is on the envelope itself. You just lick the envelope. People did that in the past. And you close the envelope, right? And then you have the introduction later on of postcards, which became incredibly popular and remained popular for, from, from 1870 for the next 100 years, right? Again, something that has fallen out of fashion. And, and the existence of postcards, right, where you have on one side a picture, on the other side you have the address and a space for a text. The uh, introduction of postcards raised issues of privacy that are current today, right? What is your, uh, how is privacy guaranteed when you send out an email or a text, etc.? Now, keep in mind one thing that, again, people have lost track of is the fact that when you see postcards from the, the, the past, if you go on eBay to buy a collectible postcard from 1890 or 1910, the text is on the picture itself, not just in the back. The back would be the space for something longer, like a short letter. But on the picture itself, if it was a city, it could be on, on the section of the sky above the city, people would write things because when people received the postcard, they would put it on, the, on a wall somewhere to display, and therefore, once it was attached, this is what they wanted to see. The image itself, and who sent it, and some message of friendship, uh, manifestation of cordiality from that person. So people would write on the image itself something that then fell out of fashion during the post-war period, the 1950s and 60s, people stopped doing that. Tourism was connected with postcards. So the idea is wherever you go, you send out a postcard and speed in this case is the sense of immediacy. I go to a place and there is plenty of anecdotal evidence of this phenomenon. People go to a place that is, uh, has, has some uh, attraction for, for tourists or for people in general. And the first thing they do is buy a postcard and send it out because they want people as soon as possible to know that they were there, right? Before they come back from the vacation, why they were in the vacation, right? They want to give this sense, I was here now in this place that you see in the picture. And of course, this prompts, uh, uh, motivates an increase, the request for an increase in literacy, right? Because you need to read more if you have all these letters, these postcards circulating, you need to be able to write more proficiently. So it is not just professional. It is part of the human experience. If you don't have literacy, then you cannot participate in this phenomenon, which would be similar to uh, at, at a different level for our social media. If you don't have literacy, how are you present in the social media if your level of literacy is not adequate? Having an efficient postal system creates an opportunity for a new booming business. By the end of the 19th century, especially in the US, a lot of items, a lot of products are sold through a catalog system, mail order. And it is not just material product, right? It could be furniture that you can order and have delivered, but it is also knowledge. One of the branches in the success of the mail order business, one of the uh, branches that uh, is, is really uh, um, having a large success is mail order lessons. So the promise made in this catalog, subscribe, we will send you material and you become a proficient mechanic. For example, when the automobiles come out, you learn how to fix an automobile or how to fix tires, or you learn how to become a door-to-door a -door salesman, right? So even those things, even training, packages, education, knowledge, travels through the postal system. The telegraph is the highest form 
of a communication network that is developed during the system. But it is not something that comes out as entirely new. You know what the telegraph is, right? You have an electric wire and impulses travel through this electrical wire, short or long, in, in the most developed language, which is the Morse uh, system, right? Dashes and dots. And the combination of these dashes and dots get translated into communication. And because it is done electrically, the communication, the data travels very quickly, although they had a problem with signal decay. So they couldn't just have one electric system of electrical wires uh, transporting messages from Paris to Berlin, for example, they had to have relay station. That is to say, every 100 miles later, the distance is increased, you would have a station receiving the message and then transmitting the message to the next station, which made the process not the, the process of communication from point of departure to destination, instead of being a few seconds, then it could be minutes or it could be an hour, depending, because you, you could send a, a, a by, by the 1900s, you could send a telegram from Paris to Beijing and vice versa. Only would have to be relayed several times across Asia and then across Europe. It, was not, it is not new because there was this system which was highly developed in certain countries such as France uh, the semaphore lines were just visual communication systems relaying on tower and site. So you can click because it's really fascinating and at least look at the pictures that you find in here. So you have towers of different kinds placed on hills or mountains with a system on top that could be oriented arms that could be oriented in different ways to uh, communicate a code that was associated with a letter or a group of letters. Of course, in this case, relay is vital, right? Because the limitation of this is how far can you see and read the message, even using telescopes, even using binoculars. And therefore, between one tower and the next, you can expect the distance of 10 miles, otherwise there will be days when uh, you cannot communicate, could be 15 miles, 20 miles under ideal conditions, so you need a lot of tower, but this was actually used for strategic messages, for military messages, for messages with political relevance. But this gave the idea that a system of communication was important and then gave way to the invention of the telegraph which was one of those technologies invented by multiple people in multiple uh, areas uh, with similar uh, systems, right? And because it is part of the process of globalization, you have the creation of a telegraph union where countries agree to use the same standards of communication so that messages can travel seamlessly from Paris to Beijing. Right? And you have the first 20 countries signing the treaty in 1865, and more countries add to it during the next 50 years. So you have electricity used for communication for the very first time, and it's all connected. Telegraph wires usually are alongside the train tracks. Not always, right? But oftentimes that is the case. And already, look! Before the Civil War, 1859, already you can send a telegram from New York to San Francisco because you have wires crisscrossing the nation. And then, only seven years later, cables are placed under, on, on the bottom of the Atlantic so that you can send a telegram from New York to London or Paris. So you have a sense of this globalization based on communication, on media that allows knowledge and information to travel more quickly. And everything becomes faster, even information benefits from this idea that speed is essential. So the news come to rely on telegrams, right? So because in an almost instantaneous way, you can know what happens. Routers, which are still operating in the field of uh, 
media communication is created as an agency and they rely on telegrams. The Associated Press had been created in 1846 and later will come to rely on telegrams. And some of the newspapers are based on that idea. For example, in France, you have Le Matin, created in the 1880s. And at the, on the first page of Le Matin, on both corners, the top corners, you have the telegraph poles. Because under the title Le Matin, it says uh, Le Dernier, I don't remember the word for telegram in France. So these are the news based on the latest telegrams from all over the world. And in fact, later on, Le Matin in 1907 will uh, pay for the first global race, a race where six automobiles will leave Beijing in June and try to reach Paris as quickly as possible. And the event will become a global media event because the crews on these cars, and oftentimes these cars had a journalist on board, would stop at, train, at telegraph stations and send out their progress and any news related to this uh, endurance race uh, to the European uh, newspapers. There is a lot of public information, public, it could be administrative, it could be political, military, that uh, travels across the telegraph, including military orders, the war of Crimea, there was a war in Crimea in 1853. Uh, in fact, even Italy, the state of Piedmont, it was then the duty of Piet Piedmont, participated, sorry, <laughs> participated in it. So there were Italian bersaglieri that died in Crimea uh, during this period. Um, and during this war, uh, you, you have a strategic use of the telegraph to transmit orders. It is also important to remember the Crimean War because you have the first important uh, use of photography to cover a war. And I invite you to click on uh, these articles. They're about Roger Fenton, the British photographer who took pictures of the war, and about the most famous, one of the first pictures of a war called the Valley of the Shadow of Death, which might or might not have been staged by Fenton himself. And there is an entire book uh, written on it and several blogs devoted to it. There are two versions of this picture. This is the picture that became popular and went across the world. Uh, this is a battlefield and everywhere you see these are, uh, th these balls are the ammunition shot by artillery during the battle. This is after the battle in Crimea near Sevastopol. And you can see that a lot of these are on the road, which you can imagine being traveled by the soldiers and the soldiers being hit. However, there is another version of this picture by the same photographer where you don't see the balls, right? You hardly see any on the road. And according to many, the photographer staged, moved the balls to give this idea of war, of this rain of fire uh, all over the moving uh, troops. But there are other theories, and you can explore some of the references are there in the Wikipedia articles. <coughs> the American Civil War, of course. Even during the Civil War, the telegraph was used to relay military orders. And then there is a lot of private information that travels. Again, families for the next 100 years communicate all the urgent important news, especially when a member of the family dies or when someone is born, when someone is married, family would use telegrams. And as I said, even the 1960s, uh, every family would send out at least a few telegrams a year, depending on the occasion to a variety of people. Business related information, of course, travels through telegraph, through the telegraph, especially in reference to the stock market where you need to act quickly, right, to change your, your uh, investments. So the idea of the web being an instantaneous highway is born there with this kind of communication network, right? And the Morse code 
is the language that will become standard, but there, are, there were many other languages that were experimented with, and then the Morse code will become the universal language of uh, the telegraph, and also the universal language of communication across the globe, right? So there is this globalization of technology and communication. And of course, you have economically, you have the creation of oligopolies or in some area monopolies established, meaning that there are companies who want to control telegraphy, that want to control the telegraph. And uh, the, the, the first company will be Western Union. Western Union, which is now associated with sending money, right? Uh, across distances, was born as a company to uh, manage uh, telegraphic communication, especially under the leadership of the chairman, uh, known, uh, William Orton. And uh, you find some figures in here. I included this because it's fascinating how he calls the telegraph the nervous system or the commercial system. This biological metaphor is important. That Western Union had 19,000 offices in the US by the 1890s to transmit communication. And just in the New York office, there were more than 400 people employed every day sending out communication telegrams. You can imagine the volume, the number of telegrams that um, were dealt with by that office, right? Because a telegram, you know, even a telegram as a standard language has abbreviations, etc. And a telegram is usually short because it's expensive. You pay by the word or by the character. So imagine more than 400 people that have to send telegrams that on average might be two to five lines and how many each would be able to send out per hour and per day. Again, the idea that we face, the issues that we face today are already there. Policy, the agencies of the government pushing for certain policies to regulate this kind of communication business and the companies resisting and wanting to have as much freedom as possible, right? And this leads to the Antitrust Act, which is still active, right? So the, during the last 20 years, Microsoft has had to uh, reorganize, restructure their company to avoid the consequences of the Antitrust Act. Google has been threatened with being split into different companies numerous times. And of course, if this network employed thousands of people, right, 19,000 offices, not all of them, some of them only had one person, right? and others had 100 people, but you're talking about hundreds of, hundreds of thousands altogether of people being employed in this industry, and then little by little you have automatic transmitters. You don't need to, when you relay a telegram, you don't need to retype it or reformulate it in Morse code, and you have automat automation of the process. Of course, the telephone is part of this Evolution, once again, many different inventors claim to have invented the telephone. You find some referred to in the book, although they don't include the Italian inventor, Antonio Meucci, Italians believe that they invented the telephone themselves. And certainly Meucci was one of the people who worked on this technology. Graham Bell was the first one to register a successful patent. So patents, remember what we said about the importance of patents, and, and even nowadays the digital technologies relies, rely on licenses, and especially in the beginning, 1990s, 2000s, there were a lot of trials over licensing, right? Uh, and you don't see it now, but when you buy certain technologies, when you buy a Samsung phone, you're paying licenses that might go to Microsoft because Microsoft was successful in establishing a patent for technologies that were then incorporated in the uh, smartphone, etc. So Graham demonstrated this at one of the fairs in Philadelphia and already had the view, the vision of this universal network, right? So even before the web, this was envisioned and became a, a partial realization uh, 150 years ago. And of course, 
in order to operate a telephone, it's like the telegraph. You cannot call someone directly. You need to go through a series of exchange places and switchboards, right? So remember what you might have seen in films up until the 1950s. So a phone call would be directed to a hub where employers would receive your request and connect you with another exchange until you reached a phone call, uh, the, the, the telephone of another location. And in terms of the geography of this, we are in the middle of this development. New Haven was the first place to have switchboards, right? Orton, the founder, the, the chairman of Western Union refused to fund the development of a, of a telephone system, right? He didn't believe, he was a strong believer in Telegram, didn't understand the importance of the phone, so he said, no, I don't want to uh, provide funds for the development of a, of a competing technology, competing against Trump. Bell. Then he changed his mind later on, he uh, went to at Thomas Edison to work together, it was kind of late, and there was economic competition, legal issues, and later on, uh, some of the issues were resolved by the creation of the National Belt Company, which incorporated previous uh, operators in this area. Now, keep in mind, again, we've lost the sense of this, but the telephone became a broadcasting system. The telephone was not simply a way for two people to be in contact and exchange information. The telephone worked as a radio. In fact, it continued to be used as a radio in many areas, in many places, by many individuals, even after the invention of the radios into the 1920s. So when Queen Victoria in 1876 was allowed to try a telephone, she didn't hear, she didn't talk to someone else on the other end of the telephone. She used the telephone to hear a singer sing an aria. So she actually experimented the telephone as a radio, not as a communication device between individuals. And in Hungary, you have this visionary who uh, at the time was assisted by Nikola Tesla before he moved to the United States, who developed a system with subscribers because you would subscribe and then the phone would ring several times during the day and on the other end they would be broadcasting the news that you could hear the uh, reports about the stock exchange sports news or simply music or even educational lectures okay so keep in mind before the radio the phone was also used as a radio and it was not just hungary although this is a, a, a very good example but in paris they were called theater phones you could again use the phone to follow music concerts or theatrical shows actually the phone was being used as a radio and already people such as Puskas were discussing how can we act the visual aspect to this. So we have the phone and people can listen to a radio, radio broadcast. How can we add images to it? So already they're projecting the technology into the next development, that of TV, which will happen only in uh, the 1930s. In Britain, the development of a telephone system was nationalized and uh, the US understood, US society understood the power of this technology earlier than uh, the, the British people. Uh, as, as the book will tell you, the idea in Great Britain was that the telephone was not for the millions, was something that would be used by a small number of people. They also complained about the fact that you have telephone wires that are ruining the historical landscape of a place with a long history such as England. Now, so in the US already by 1892, you had telephone lines between New York and Chicago. By 1900, you have one phone. Of course, we're talking about fixed phones every 60 people. And by 1904, in Manhattan, there were 6.5 phones per 100 people, Manhattan and the Bronx, with the creation of AT&T, 
whereas uh, Great Britain was uh, had much lower 